the Environment Committee to order for August 23rd, 2022. Welcome. And I'm super excited about today's agenda. I think we have two really interesting things to talk about. And so without objection, uh, the uh, agenda is approved and that takes, uh, we should do a roll call. No, we don't need no, to do a roll anymore. call. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yep. Yeah. We, Welcome back. We I know. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, but we do have some minutes from August 9th, 2022. Mr. For, Chair, I would move the minutes. I already made one suggested correction, which has been resolved and is in there, so they can be approved as written. Great. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Battle it out between the two of you. There you go. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Carries. And that takes us to the three items on our consent business agenda, which is the Uniform Rental Services Program, the comp sewer plans for both Bayport and Willerney. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. And second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Carries. Thank you. And on to our first item, information item, which is the heart of the MCES vision and mission. A lot of work has gone into this. Um, I was reviewing the presentation and saw just a whole slew of names that were connected to this. So I imagine it wasn't just something you just came up with uh, in, in an afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, committee, for the opportunity to present today. I'm Deb McKinley. I am manager of programs and administration in Environmental Services Administration and Communications Group. Um, so I, the, our vision and mission was introduced to you previously. Um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but clean water for future generations. Some people say we wear it on our sleeves and our hearts. Some people say we wear it around our necks. Mm -hmm. So I think you're all familiar with that piece. Um, and just as a refresher, also sharing our mission statement that we partner plan and provide services to protect our region's waters. Um, and that, that definitely aligns with the council's vision and mission as well. You can see the uh, pieces on the side there. Um, but most importantly, we want to talk about how the staff were engaged in the process to get to our vision and mission. Um, there were 40 staff from across the division who participated, so leaders at all levels, so everywhere from, from the executive team, middle management, and, and staff um, on the field, at the field front. And so um, we've brought guests here today to talk about how, that, how we got to that vision and mission, how they were a part of that, and what it means to them and how it fits within their work. So I'm just the, uh, the MC to introduce the folks who are um, here to talk about our vision and mission and how it, how it relates to them. So i will like, like to invite Mark Gardner up first. Welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm not even sure I need a microphone with my voice, but if I'm too loud, let me know and I will move this back. I'd like to thank everybody for the chance to come down here. It's really an honor to be invited. I'm one of the frontline workers. My name is Mark Gardner. I work at the Seneca Wastewater Plant in Egan. I'm a business unit coordinator, which means I'm a longtime operator that moved up into a supervisory position. And the fact that we were invited, Lisa, thank you, Craig Edlin, thank you, that I even got the invite to be on this committee originally was, was pretty unique for me. I was really amazed by the people, a lot of people that I knew and people that I didn't know that were on this committee. Their commitment, their passion, the diversity, the backgrounds were all so different, but we really took a lot of time to come together. And somebody had mentioned in the first meeting, do we realize that we are redoing someone else's mission and vision statement. And that was a huge burden because I know the people before us have really worked hard to create something and we were supposed to take this and then do something with it. And it was, it was kind of intimidating at first, but what made me feel really good about it was the roles that everybody played in this, that I could look to somebody else that had a totally different perspective, yet we were talking about the same mission and vision, what we all are here for in the first place. How my work fits into it, I'm boots on the ground, frontline worker. Um, I go in, I coordinate with the shift, which means I coordinate with the electricians, 
the machinists, the planner schedulers, the managers, to create what is a good environment for all of us that are working there, but then to get our permits met and everything that's expected by the council like that. So it's a pretty big intermingling that follows along with this vision and mission statement to protect, plan, and provide. And that's, I didn't think about it in those terms specifically when I walk through the door every morning, but that's exactly what I'm doing. And I think that is why I was so proud to be behind this, is it was so funny when we finished it and I looked at it and I thought, wow, this is really simple. And it is when you look at it, but everything that is beneath the layers is what I do, but it is a lot of work. It's a lot of planning. It's a lot of people working together. It's a lot of people having a passion to really make, it's not meeting the permit exactly every day. It's what we do and why we wanna be so proud about meeting those permits. The council celebrates us when we meet them. When we don't meet something, it's a learning experience. We try to figure out whether it was mechanical, personal, what, you know, do we need to work on something? Just the whole workings of the organization to me amaze me daily on how we do this together. It is such a huge piece to get done, yet everybody's doing their individual part and it comes together somehow. And that's just a kudos to people that put in the time, such as you folks and the people that are showing up every day and our managers mm -hmm. and higher ups. It's, it's a nice blending. Um, what I tell my family and friends about my work, it's very interesting, depends on the crowd you're talking to. You can be fairly eloquent that I'm an operating engineer. <laughs> I'm a steward of the environment. And then when you're with the kind of more friendly people, you kind of let it, you know, we work at a wastewater treatment plant. Sometimes it gets dirty. But I thought of something just quick to tell you, and I won't take up too much of your time. We have a building that's called the Headworks, and it's where the uh, influent water comes in from the cities. And it runs through bar screens, which take out a lot of the solid stuff. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry if you guys already know all this information. I just want to let you know what I'm talking about. We have a serpentine belt in that building, which collects the rags, the grit, the sticks, anything that's big that gets pulled out. It's the heart and soul of that building. It has to keep moving. Well, it fell off at the Seneca plant, and we went about three to four weeks where we get 30 million gallons a day, around the average, where we hand bucketed with five gallon buckets, along with uh, many, many help from other divisions and people. But we had to wheelbarrow and hand bucket this stuff 24 seven. And to be honest with you, after the initial shock wore off of, oh, we gotta do what till when? When is this gonna get fixed? Everybody showed up. We were never short to where we couldn't perform that duty. Nothing was violated. We didn't send stuff out to the river. And Craig had, was nice enough to come out and see what we needed, see what, you know, how are you guys doing? People were amazed that a manager would come out at his level and see us. And I sat back a little bit and looked at everybody and I'm like, this is unreal that we did this for this long. And it really got me thinking. So the answer to the question, what do I do? What needs to get done? And we do it proudly and we show up. We showed up through COVID. We show up through deaths, illnesses, whatnot. And it's, it really, really speaks to the people that you have working here. So that's, that's what I got. So mm -hmm. does anybody have any questions or anything? Any questions? Please. I just want to make sure that it got back to the workers how grateful we were for that all hands on deck effort to oh, well, thank clear you for the, the screens when the belt fell off because we did Make a point of we recognizing how much work that was, grueling, stinky, dirty work, but you guys jumped in and did it and kept everything going, and we really appreciate that. Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Chair and the committee members. That, you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I had a lot of people ask me or tell me and ask me, you know, I, I, they were surprised that we got the response we did because it was so recognized, but I thought it was recognized throughout the system and, and we knew it. And that, I think that was one of the things that made it worthwhile. I mean, we know that's our job, we do it. I suppose if you ask a firefighter, why did, why did he go put out the fire? Well, it's his job. But really at the end of the day, especially in situations like that, that weren't very pleasant and it took its toll on people, we were recognized by everyone. And it was literally in newsletters, personal uh, emails, and everything. So yes, thank you for uh, appreciating what we did. It was one of those situations that when you're in the middle of it, it's kind of like, oh God, let's just get through this. But when you're done, you look back on it and we realize that we've, what we've done might not be seen by every fact, it's not seen by a lot of people, but it's a very, very, proud moment that that's what we did and everything's running well again 
and the, the intermingling of the different levels of people that we had to deal with, from planner schedulers to managers to electricians to machinists to every, everybody involved, it was amazing that we could put it together like that. And I'm just proud of my guys for, and gals for showing up every day and doing it because it was not a pleasant job. But yes, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, when things work well, um, you know, we don't, they don't make the newspaper, yeah. right? But yep. we, we know, uh, and you know better than anybody, when, uh, when a belt goes down yeah. or a giant chunk of fog <laughs> or whatever, the, yeah, yep, that you know, too. Yes. smacks yep. into something, or if there's something in the interceptor that shouldn't yeah. be there, which we've seen this summer, Folks like you, folks are jumping right on it, and um, and it is all hands on deck. And uh, you you said it better than 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 any of us could. And so um, yeah, we're just extremely grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to invite Don Ketchup to share his experience. You're not a pen, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a pen. My friend and dear colleague, Mark Gardner, pretty tough to follow that, I'll tell you yeah. that. He was afraid I was going to outshine him. I don't know where he got that from. But uh, My name is Don Kisser. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come here, be here today. Uh, unlike a lot of the people that were up on that list of the 40 people, I, uh, I was not asked to be a part of this. I actually volunteered. And I, I take a lot of pride in that because... Uh, there's been a large shift uh, in the last several years uh, within the Met Council, uh, partially because of uh, people like Lisa who really want to expand the uh, inclusivity to um, several different groups that were not very well represented and didn't really have a whole lot of uh, a lot of voice in some of the stuff that was done. So, having a as many people uh, at the level that we are, um, and maybe I should back up just a little bit. Uh, I work at the Seneca plant myself as well uh, with Mark. Uh, I'm the lead electrician out there. So I represent um, some of the uh, the construction labor group uh, as part of the people that were on that list. Um, we are not a typical group that uh, gets involved in a lot of things like this. We, you know, we do the construction side of things. We make sure that the, the maintenance is performed. Uh, all of the permit calibrations are done on incineration, uh, out in the aeration tanks, make sure everything runs smoothly so guys like Mark can do his job. And we take a lot of pride in that in, in and of ourselves. That's just what we do because whether we do it here, we working for a contractor someplace, that's, that's who we are. We, we build, we make better, we go about our business. Uh, this is a this is a very unique place for uh, people like us to work because we come in and we do a job and we maintain facilities. Um, so we don't have a single person that we're looking to make rich, so to speak. So um, <laughs> this isn't uh, this isn't Lisa's company. We're not <laughs> here making Lisa rich. Maybe we are. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> but. <laughs> that was the one thing that I wanted to be able to bring back to my group, and I wanted to be that that representative for our group um, because I like to I like to think of myself as kind of a a bridge between what we do, boots on the ground, and be able to eloquently speak with managers, um, be a part of groups like this to really put a good face forward for our groups. Likewise, going back on that, I want to be able to go back to my group and say this is the benefit of that. What we got from that benefit from this was um, I got to be a part of this group of incredible people that really had the same thought of trying to morph the mission and vision statement into something that was really substantial and something that was gonna work for us for a lot of years. And um, because of one of the wonderful gentlemen that is behind me, uh, I was asked to speak in front of the, uh, the group of uh, electricians, machinists, uh, maintenance operators, uh, pipe fitters, painters at uh, at Metro, kind of uh, impromptu, and I kind of gave them the same speech that I'm giving you guys here. Because a lot of the times, like I said, they don't really understand kind of the higher level of the things, and I wanted to be that bridge and that voice for us at that level, and also bring the voice from these kind of level of meetings to them. And what I said is, what you really need to understand is that we're trying to 
keep this process running and do the best job we can. This isn't about making somebody money, like I said. So we're not going in to try to do it the cheapest, the fastest, in and out. We're trying to do the best job we can, provide the best service that we can, and put our expertise into it. So I use that opportunity, speaking in front of people, to implore them to do what they could to bring their expertise to every situation that they have. And on the flip side, bring it back to their leads, their managers, to use that expertise to create a better process if they see it fit. Because in the end, it benefits everybody in the community because of what we discharge out to the river. And that's what we're really here for, is to make sure that the environment is maintained and as self-serving as it may seem, it's also our communities that we're serving as well. So that, uh, that pretty much wrapped up my uh, speech that I had for them. <laughs> but, uh, and for the most part, that's what I tell my friends and family as well, is that uh, we are stewards for the environment and we are doing the best we can to make sure that the process is updated and set up as best as we can and go in every day with that mission of trying to go in and make sure that everything stays running to keep our permits in line. Because I take a lot of pride in that every single day, and I know my colleagues do too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are correct in taking a lot of pride in that. That's an amazing achievement. Any, any questions for Mr. Mr. Kisro? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well said. And Mallory, last but not least. Welcome. Hey. Um, so thank you again, like my other coworkers have said, for the opportunity to come here today and to share a little about um, myself and what I do for Metropolitan Council of Environmental Services. My name is Mallory Vanis, and I work within the Operations Support Services Business Unit, specifically within the laboratory. I'm one of our assistant laboratory managers. In my current role, I manage our quality assurance department within the lab. Um, so in terms of the process about creating this mission and vision, like uh, Don and Mark have said, really the passion that people were bringing forward was impressive. And we had some pretty lively conversations at times about certain words, protect versus provide. We had them both in there, then we only had one, then we had them both again. But it really just underscored how people, seriously people were taking it and how really critical it was for them to be able to see themselves, their departments, and their jobs and how they were speaking for their coworkers to be able to ensure that they could see them themselves and their departments and their jobs in this mission, in this mission, that's what we're gonna call now, the mission and vision that we were um, creating. And kind of the other thing that was really impressive to me about the process, specifically about the mission, was the use of the action words. So we're partnering, we're planning, we're providing. It's what we do literally every day. It made it more real to me and not just you know, kind of the idealistic mantra that we have, but I'm actually here doing this every single day, and so are all the people I work with. So I can obviously see myself and my department that I work in the lab in this. We partner with folks within the stakeholders within um, MCES, groups like Water Resources, you'll hear from Cassie later, she's in the Water Resources group, our Industrial Waste Division, obviously the operations. Um, we also have some external governmental agencies and. Uh, Part, uh, partners that we help do some work for. Um, and so that's a, a big part of our job. We also create a lot of plans. We have to be certified. We have to make sure that we're keeping our standard operating procedures up to date. We have to make sure that we're keeping our lab up to date, that we have good lab practice, that we have standards within our different areas as we've really emphasized cross-training and greater um, interchangeability of staff throughout the year. So that's been a big task for us. So that takes a ton of planning, planning who's gonna train where, planning how you're gonna have your documents lined up and things like that. And also, obviously, this is the big one. This is what I think people think of, obviously, when they think of the lab, is we're providing data. That's ultimately our most important purpose, is providing data. But there's a lot that goes into that final data point at the end that is often unseen. So I really liked how the partner and plan part was brought into this, too, because it really kind of underscores some of the other things that go into that ultimate, what are you providing? So just like uh, Don and Mark said, what do I tell folks about what I do? I Work in a lab, that's fairly obvious. People can kind of understand what happens in a lab, more or less. But really, it's more than that. It is about protecting our waterways, protecting our recreation, protecting our environmental health. You know, we are the land of 10,000 lakes. And I think that Minnesotans, by and large, really, that's important to them. That's a value that we all share. It's a commonality that we have. So that's what I like to try to focus on when I do have conversations with people about what I do and where I work, because I feel like that come, people come into that conversation with an openness and a curiosity. 
and that we are here to help protect and do our part. And I'm, that's the reason why I started working here and that's the reason why I have continued to work here is because that's really important to me that that's what we do. At the end of the day, I can go home and I'm proud to be a part of that. Wonderful. Any questions for Ms. Vanis? Yes, please. I just want to make a comment. Uh, thanks to you and the rest of the team here today, but I do not drink bottled water ever. I only drink tap water due to all the commitment of, of the quality that you do and your dedication on that. And I try to tell the story every day. You know, I'm, I'm here on it then. And thanks to, uh, for all your work. I appreciate it. Very good. Yeah, please. If I can just uh, make a couple comments and, and add my thanks to everybody for showing up today and, and uh, great messages. I, I just want to say, people go, what's servant leadership? You know, the governor said, we want servant leadership in this state. I think you've just seen some really good examples of servant leadership, and we have it throughout. And what I get excited about with this vision and mission is the ability to connect it for everyone. Everyone should be mm -hmm. able to be inspired, even when it's the kind of days that that Mark <laughs> described, where it's really unpleasant, but mm -hmm. you're still, it's the journey. The destination is important, but the journey can also be a big part of the inspiration, and that's the kind of workplace we want to have. And servant leadership definitely is the model we're trying to stand up and, and use and apply. So more and more, we're trying to increase the opportunities for folks like Dave and Don to be able to, and Mallory, to participate in those kinds of things. So um, we're going to get there because we've got the inspiration amongst a lot of people. Mm, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Jerry. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your stories. And, you know, I come from a, a union background. One of the uh, questions we ask our union members on a regular basis is, do you feel like you're part of a family of, you know, brothers and sisters? And um, I'm always surprised to, to see the, you know, I guess nowadays with so much division and, um, uh, isolation and kind of people working in their silos, I was surprised to see how people feel so connected and, and committed to each other. And um, I think that really shined through with your, with your testimony today. I mean, that there, there's a culture of, of family and commitment to each other, and, and that carries forward to the community. So keep up the good work, and thank you for sharing. Absolutely, yeah, please, Council Member Thank Wolf. you, Mr. Chair. So I've been with the council <clears throat> since 2009. I'm the longest sitting current council member. And uh, when I first came, I toured the Empire plant and I got assigned to be on the Environmental Services Committee. And I knew a little bit about it because as a city council member, we were sending things down the pipe and had to maintain our own pipe and everything. But <laughs> Since I've been here, ES has been the coolest thing for me of the council, and I brag about it all the time. And each year, you guys just keep getting better and better, and I'm more and more proud of everything that we do here. We've been through a lot of changes since 2009, but they've all been good changes, and I really appreciate all of the work that you guys do, including the, the defining your, your mission statement, but just... You guys are, are great, and I love working with you, and I just want to say thanks. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking uh, at one of our last Met Council meetings, uh, Lisa presented on the budget, and you brought up uh, the, the bricklayers, the three bricklayers, and they were asked what they do, and one said, that they're laying bricks. And another person said, I'm building a wall. And the third person was asked what they're doing. And they said, I'm building a cathedral. And I thought, oh, well, that's like, you would just describe that all too. It's like, OK, what are you working on? Well, I'm working uh, on a motor. Um, I'm working on an aeration system. I'm providing clean water for future generations. That's what I do on a daily basis. I provide clean water. So 
well done. Um, just keep up the good work, and uh, we'll try to do things on our on this side of the, the dais, and you folks keep doing the great work on your side of the dais, and t together we'll keep providing for clean water. That's what it's all about. All right. Thanks again. Great work. Okay, tough to tough to beat that one, um, <laughs> but now we have a wonderful story to tell about chloride, <laughs> or not so wonderful, perhaps. Maybe a little bit of good, a little bit of a little bit of bad. Tessa, is it okay if we use these mics? Are they on? I do not know. They should be. Are these mics on? Yes. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having us, and we'll do our best to uh, top that one. But I really appreciate Mallory's introduction, because, uh, um, or Mallory's segue with the discussing data, the data that the mm -hmm. lab puts out. That's, this is what we're going to talk about here, some of the data that Mallory's group made for us. So thanks so much for the opportunity for us to present here today. My name is Cassie Champion. I work in the Water Resources Group, and I coordinate our stream monitoring program I'm going to talk to you about a recent analysis we've done of our stream chloride data. So our stream and tributary river monitoring program goes back to the late 80s, and it uh, includes our WAMP monitoring stations, which I think you've heard about recently. Those are the stations we operate in partnership with local cooperators like uh, watershed districts, SWCDs, and that monitoring works also partially funded by the Pollution Control Agency. So today we're going to talk about 20 years worth of chloride data. It took about two years to do the data analysis, the modeling work, and to prepare the communications that we're going to be sharing. But I want you to keep in mind throughout the entire presentation that it really took more than 20 years to complete this project. Long-term data sets can tell very powerful stories of change over time but the only way to collect 20 years worth of data is to collect data for 20 years in a row. <laughs> and the only way to do that is to have a commitment to long-term data sets. And MCES has some of the longest water quality data sets anywhere in the entire Mississippi River Basin because as an organization, we've had a commitment since the 20s to collect data. Because of that, we can perform these really powerful statistical analyses and uh, draw conclusions and make recommendations that are meaningful. Since the 1920s. In the 1920s. Not Since the 2020s. the 1920s. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. 1920s. <laughs> That's impressive. So the map that I've got up here is showing where chloride is, uh, well, known to be increasing in the Twin Cities area, which is essentially nearly every water body that we have studied. So we've got a 30-year increasing chloride trend on our Mississippi, Minnesota, and St. Croix rivers, and a 20-year trend of increasing chloride on most of the streams and tributary rivers that we studied throughout the region. Lakes are also affected by chloride pollution, but not included in this study. On this map, you can additionally see in red the 18 stream reaches that are impaired for chloride. So chloride impairment is something that the PCA designates, and it means that the chloride concentration is high enough in this water body that aquatic life is impacted by the high chloride. The chloride pollution causes a lot of different problems on land and in the water. So, you know, you can picture your spalled sidewalk, damage to bridges and roads. It's a hazard for pets. Dogs lick their paws, get sick from the salt. It's trouble for wildlife, plants, soil, aquatic life. Chloride pollution is just, it's a very uh, pervasive problem. And an important thing to know about chloride is that it is a permanent pollutant. Currently, with existing technology, there is no way to remove it once it's in the water. It's a permanent part of the ecosystem. So where does chloride come from? And the University of Minnesota completed a pretty extensive study to try to answer that question. And in Minnesota, the majority of chloride in um, water bodies comes from de-icing salt. And in the urbanized metro area, you see that 44% is that that's a statewide value in the metro um, more urbanized watersheds, that's 
most likely higher. De-icing salt is a bigger proportion of chloride sources. But other big sources in Minnesota are synthetic fertilizer, household water softening, and uh, livestock waste. Those top four are um, the, the biggest sources that we have. And I just I want to point out, this is important to know, that our large rivers are not really at risk of impairment from chloride. And our utility permits are not going to be changed any time in decades, maybe never, for the amount of chloride that's coming out of our utilities. Um, the impact of chloride pollution on large water bodies is just mostly blunted by that large volume of water. So we've got a, we've got a saying in the industry, maybe you've heard it before, dilution, dilution is, is the, the solution, solution <laughs> to pollution. Okay, it's, it's kind of, it's a, maybe a little bit too cynical, um, and it's also grossly oversimplified, but for the Mississippi River and the metro area, it's also basically true. You know, the chloride pollution is being diluted by that enormous volume of water. And the reason I'm downplaying chloride pollution as a hazard for our large rivers is because I want to emphasize the risk to the small streams in our region. 18 stream reaches are already impaired for chloride. That means they are not supporting of aquatic life as they should be because there is so much chloride pollution in them. That's already. Small water bodies simply don't have the capacity to absorb the additional chloride without some kind of negative ecological effect. And our local partners really struggle to improve water quality. In fact, our local partners really struggle to prevent an increasing decline in water quality. So chloride pollution is a serious and growing problem in our region. And now that I've set the stage a little bit, I'm gonna have Hong come and talk about the chloride analysis that we completed. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks uh, for coming here for uh, opportunity to talk about the chloride we did just in the last few years. And uh, my name's Hong Wang, I'm a principal environmental scientist, and I work for council about 20 years. So it's almost senior staff. So, and uh, <clears throat> also thanks for Cassie talk about the background about this project. And uh, as you know, uh, chloride naturally exists in uh, our water, natural water with a low concentration. But due to the human activities, the concentration increased very fast during the next 10 or 20 years. So it caused a huge problem. So a few years ago, five, six years ago, we published a paper for a water quality assessment for regional uh, water quality for regional river. And uh, we found, we assessed about 40 years data. We found the most traditional pollutants is improved and they were substantially improved, including bacteria and the nutrients in the TSS suspended solids, and except the nitrate as traditional pollution, but increase slow down. Only problem, only problem, pay attention, chloride, continue increase straight to forward in our regional water. So this uh, tracked our attention, and after we finished the project, we say, well, okay, uh, we should to understand what's the source for the chloride uh, towards our regional river. Of course, we know uh, chloride come from upstream in metro area, but quite a lot come from our region in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, from the stream. And so, uh, so this project, we try to understand what's the current condition of chloride and what has changed over time during the last 20 years, we have, because we have 20 years data. And also we uh, try to understand what's the major impact of chloride condition in our region. So, and also finally we try to understand what is budget. This means chloride balance in the region. So this actually is, we spent about two and three years. It's one of the larger projects in Mass Council did during the last two or three years. And the results, we did actually comprehensive assessment. It's a lot of result. We attract regional attention. We are invited by the region, state, and even nation to give presentation about our results. And because Korra is very uh, uh, general uh, uh, um, substance people use for our own food, people not pay attention, but we need to address to people. This chloride make problem now. Even I work with our 30, 
and also a, a environment committee member in our city, so address core right for our community. So um, this study, we have uh, 18 uh, uh, metro string, and this string, as you see the map in a little blue, and they cover about 50% of metro area of the watershed. And this including large or small watershed, you say uh, most large watershed is surrounding the metro area, but small in the middle of metro area. And also land use, including urban agriculture, mixed land use. And the land use really pay attention, impact to our core right, you will see our results. And also this 18 string, including three string leased by the MPCA or EPA as chloride impaired, so this means very high chloride concentration. So uh, five, also 18 string, including five groundwater dominant, dominant strain. This gave us opportunity to learn what is impact of chloride from, and, uh, uh, and from groundwater. So um, like I say, this we have a lot of uh, result information, but due to the limited time, we only talk about major key finding for uh, for this for you to understand what's correct condition now, and our results and correct condition. This means concentration, and uh, this uh, the plot show you on uh, the average and this this average annual median concentration during the last 10 years. So this concentration, when you see this, actually, if you talk about a daily concentration, it will be huge high because, like I say, this uh, let's just address median annual <laughs> median concentration. So uh, uh, this is why. And this plot, actually, you see uh, we have 18 string here in, in the Y. And this is arranged by the land use. On the top is highly urbanized. Lower is more, ab more agriculture or mixed land use, and, the, and X is annual media concentration. So color, three uh, represent, uh, red color is the least by MPC for chloride impaired, and also yellow is uh, least by MPC for highly, have a high risk being impaired, in potential being impaired, and the blue is means just not impaired. And also we have included four uh, for uh, groundwater dominant stream, this uh, marked by star, probably you're hard to see, and by star of the name, but this all uh, 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 stream uh, located in the middle of, of uh, this curve. So I mentioned this, well, you will see what's the impact of chloride. So based on the result, you can say chloride concentration vary depending on different location, different stream, and also, and the high chloride concentration you will find on the top, this means uh, really from the more urbanized watersheds and also relatively chloride concentration in, in, in the groundwater dominant stream. So this means impact, impact by groundwater still is low. I mean, in terms of concentration, but different story in the late you will see it. And also, we, this 18 string come from three major ri river basin from the Mississippi River, Minnesota River, and St. Croix River. So we didn't see any big difference from the stream from different three basins, no big difference. But this plot will have gave you a different story. This is actually the same layout of concentration, but an X is uh, overall change. This means concentration is changing during the last 20 years. And the same color, same meaning, I will talk up, not talk about again. So, but you see, uh, this concentration, based on the result, we found the concentration increase across all region, no exception of but, except the Cover Creek. Cover Creek mark here, like a, you can see the N, no trend, this means uh, statistic and not significant. This means a little bit of a stable change, not change, but the most, Cross region all uh, increased. And uh, chloride, there's a few string, at least three string chloride concentration uh, more than doubled during the last 20 years. Just 20 years' time, we have more than doubled. And also, we found different from the concentration, we found uh, chloride. Uh, have a large increase in the string, groundwater dominant string. Now start groundwater start to impact our surface water, and also the same as we do not find any difference between the three major river river basin. <clears throat> 
And uh, this last plot is about 20 years, a long period, but people may want to know what's changed during the recent years. So this plot, same as the last plot, but the difference is we just uh, calculated recent five years. And this five years also give us different story. You will see um, for the 20 years, chloride increase of all region, but for this one, we can find and there's only 12 string have increased. Four stable, there's no, no trend, and also two even decline. So this means during the recent five years, we have improved. And I think indicates our best manage, management practice or our investments makes sense. People start to pay attention. This, so this result gave us this information. But another story I will tell you is slower increase rate except for one string. And the last, you will see, relative last large increase in groundwater downstream. So we have to invest our money to, in, to improve water quality in the surface water, but groundwater contribute or they show their impact our stream water. And yesterday we have a, a, a same data from the presented by the U, uh, UMN uh, scientist indicates and the groundwater chloride already start increase very quickly and somewhere already start her, her taste of salt and almost a lot of uh, ground, groundwater close to the criteria, 230 milligram per liter of criteria. This means if above this one, the groundwater will be impaired. So people not pay attention, use the salt for the icing, for the, for, for the fertilizer, but really cause a problem now. So what's the impact? First, we see uh, urbanized population increase or the increase, impact our chloride condition in our stream. So, and also second impact of, of groundwater. To understand this one, I, I made this plot, this Y is average value. So the first two uh, bar is first annual uh, media concentration, and the second is yield per acre, how many kilogram, kilo, thousand, uh, kg per acre, and the third one is all, all change, and the last one is five years change. So uh, green shows uh, surface water dominant, dominant stream, but yellow shows uh, groundwater dominant stream. You will see concentration is still low compared with surface water dominant stream, and also yield is still uh, lower compared with uh, dominant, uh, surface water dominant stream. But when you take about the uh, change increase rate, the groundwater uh, impact of stream or dominant stream have huge increase now during the last 20 or 10 years. So that's why, but unfortunately, Ms. Council not have too much information of groundwater chloride. So that's why we're, we provide information and for maybe for future, we need to pay attention or have some collection or have some study for the groundwater. So lastly, we talk about uh, what's the balance of chloride. This means flow in, flow out. We calculate uh, uh, chloride load flow in from Mississippi River, Minnesota River, and St. Croix River. We found flow in total is about 336, uh, 66,000 kilograms per year, so that's a lot. And unfortunately, when we calculate flow out, we have 707,000 pounds per year. This means just small metro area, we have chloride load doubled. So the metro area contributes almost equal to upstream. So this actually, based on this one, we calculate also metro area is contribute 340,000 uh, tons per year. This is a lot compared just to how seven county metro area. So to break down of the metro area source, we found and started, uh, started 18 string contribute 35% of total 440,000 ton per year. And other 65% is contrib contributed by unstudied sources, including engaged uh, string not measured, no sample, and also surface runoff, direct runoff, and also uh, atmosphere deposit, and also directly contributed from groundwater to river. 
So this is a lot. So this means 65% of source metro areas are known with no, no information yet. And then what has impact <coughs> our uh, 18 study uh, monitor strain? And uh, we've, we compare the concentration between uh, strain and the river. And if we have high concentration, this, uh, this means we have impact. We found 17 of 18 assessment strains show a potential impact. This means 18, 17 of 18 strains have high concentration in our regional river. And uh, most chloride loads come from three major, three large rivers. And this three large river basically just because large catchment area, large area. And the concentration, of course, when you see uh, last uh, few slides, you will see most in the urbanized uh, the strain. This means in the central area of metro area. And uh, most other strain, except the three major rivers, have smaller impacts. This means they have smaller watershed area. Does not mean they have smaller, uh, lower concentrations? No, but it's a little bit com complicated story. So um, due to uh, limited time, so I just talk about this three major finding for this uh, key finding. So a uh, summary is chloride concentration varies significantly in the, in the region and also in different strain and the chloride increase cross region during the last 20 years. And also uh, increase or mostly slowed down in the region five years thanks for our uh, investment uh, benefit of uh, best, best many management practice. And also concentration, high concentration uh, related to the uh, urban land use watershed. So this key finding. Also groundwater showed a potential impact to our uh, surface water chloride and the chloride load almost doubled in the region river when it flows through the re, uh, metro area. So based on our study, we uh, also linked to the Texas uh, chloride source. We found a major metro area chloride source, including mostly including winter de-icing used for safety, traffic safety, and also fertilizer. And uh, when you use fertilizer contained chloride, and the household and the industrial water softening action is this, mostly this is directly to our river a few to our stream, but still some in the atmosphere deposits plus some um, uh, direct runoff do not, do, not, do not go to our watershed. So I think this is what I made you fight, keep fighting for this one. Thanks, Han. So we have a, a really powerful picture of chloride dynamics in the region. But that loses a lot of its power if we don't widely share it with our partners, if we're not communicating it out to the groups that have the interest and the responsibility for protecting our water resources. So uh, I'm going to briefly give you an overview of the partner communications that we developed to share the results of this study. First, we wrote uh, short reports for each watershed. We call these partner memos. And the goal of each memo, so the Nine Mile Creek uh, watershed memo was uh, we aimed to inspire uh, action to alleviate chloride pollution. So getting people to start talking about it, getting people to start talking about solutions is a goal of uh, changing the direction of some of these regional trends. Uh, additionally, we uh, wrote a regional report, which is an overview, kind of a synthesis of the dynamics region-wide, and then um, the fact sheet that's available on the table out there, sort of a very short, here's our most powerful findings, here's a call to action, um, kind of a, a quick, short read for um, a, a wide audience. We send our memos and uh, report to 28 different local organizations, including watershed districts, counties, cities, soil and water conservation districts, um, three different state agencies, and the University of Minnesota. We're all kind of our, our direct target recipients of these reports. They're also available on, on the internet. Our study was very well received by our partners, so I'm sharing a few of our thank you quotes with you. And, uh, this work uh, made a really important contribution. People really uh, thought we were filling a need by describing chloride dynamics in this way. So we helped identify, we helped to describe the regional chloride dynamics, and that's the first step in alleviating regional chloride pollution. 
Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today, and we're happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much. I know I have a number of questions, but I'll turn it over to the committee. Yeah, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, great information. Thank you for sharing it with us. I've been hearing a lot about efforts to get businesses to not use as much salt when they're salting their parking lots and stuff, which is good. And cities are trying to use products that stick better to the road so they don't have to use as much. But on the side of homeowners and the, the water softeners, I don't have a water softener and I don't have an irrigation system, so I don't know a whole lot about how all of that works. But when people do water their lawns and they have a softener, is it softened water that goes out or is it just regular, not softened water? I know, I'm in the same situation. Oh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that question. Mr. Chair and committee members, I'm in the same situation. I don't have a home water softener, but I believe uh, softened water is typically directed to only the appliances where it's relevant. And so okay. I don't think it would include, in most homes, I don't think it would include their outside So improving watering. the water softening performance apparently is a thing there a lot you know to, like everything technology has gotten better and there's been some discussion about like we have the, the water sense grants to get people to use less water maybe doing something like that to get people to get a better water softener so they're not putting so much salt in but it sounds like that would affect more just what comes out our pipes than what goes into the streams mm -hmm. is that am i understanding that correctly yeah i think you summarized it very well yeah there's uh kind of two two prongs of efforts for alleviating the home water softening and industrial water softening kind of aspect of chloride pollution and one is like you've talked about kind of homeowner interventions like that one um water softener some communities in uh, different parts of the country have also adopted centralized softening so Tank the water that softens. you're getting from your city is softened and then that that technology has efficiencies. Thank you. Yeah, I think this technology improved a lot. And in the old community, you still have used old water softening. So efficiency is very low. And also now it's advanced technology. Like in my home, because I work on the chloride, I have not used soft chloride softener. I use no, no chloride add to my use reverse. Uh, something like a fuse, so I do not have correct. Also, can have same pro, same effect to get soft water, but depends on different family. So the chloride, like uh, you know, the actually uh, dump to a sewer system, but because we have no technology, so it's directly just like a, goes through the river. So and so far, we have no good technology to treat this. Great. Yeah, we'll go Councilmember Fredson and then move on down this way. Thank you, Chair. As far as your outreach to the cities and counties, is the primary objective to, to have them make changes to, the, say, their uh, uh, public works processes, or is it about them educating homeowners to use alternatives? Yeah, thanks for that question. And Mr. Chair and committee members, um, all of the above plus more, I think, would be kind of the best <laughs> answer. Um, mm -hmm what we were able to do is describe the problem and point each watershed kind of one at a time at um, some kind of likely problems or some good follow-up actions. There are quite a few efforts um, at the state level and at the local level, uh, smart salt training, which has uh, aspects of education for homeowners and for business owners. Um, and then of course there's the larger uh, city, city streets, the real heavy equipment, um, training and technology improvements for that. And that's, I mean, in the metro area, the, those are gonna be the best kinds of improvements. We'll be uh, using less de-icing salt, using different products for de-icing. I think Please. since we need uh, uh, de-icing for safety reason, so we have no good technology. So education is very important now at this step. And also, we, we, our study will try to increase, address awareness of people to know what's pollution now becomes serious for our region. This is very important as first step to us. So. Yeah, another effort that people consider real important is um, there's uh, periodic efforts to create limited liability legislation, which I know gets talked about in various ways, but some, some of our partners consider that a real important element of overall uh, chloride pollution reduction, the idea that if a business owner is liable for an injury on their property, 
they're going to salt like crazy. But if they have limited liability for injuries due to ice on their property, that, um, then some of the smart salt training, this education is going to stick better and be more practical. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, follow up. I would just add that I personally, so uh, I have a natural stone sidewalk. So I've been using salt or uh, sand, play sand, for 15 years, and it works just fine. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just had a couple questions? of questions, yeah, I think, in here. Uh, the one is, uh, you kind of alluded to it like it's been uh, slowing down the last five years, but a lot with your education of like the streets uh, being swept twice a year by cities and the, and the smart salting and softeners getting rid of the, you know, the scheduled softeners that are you, are you seeing that, like the, the study goes till 19 of the data, but the last three years, are you seeing it trending uh, more so uh, better, I guess, or? Um, thanks for question and the and, and the chair and the committee member. So yeah, uh, actually, in the recent five years we tried to study, and uh, this is a. Uh, um, I think really contributed by the community on the uh, watershed activities to reduce this uh, uh, chloride. And uh, now I forgot to mention the technology we use to assess this chloride uh, increase trend is use a federal agent's USGS technology. This technology can remove the water impact. This means, as you know, water can be dry year, high wet year. In dry years, so will be less uh, uh, chloride bring to the oil stream and the wet year can have a more. So this, you will not say the chloride may be changed, but you can say smooth go up down. So this technology have ability to remove the impact of chloride. So what you say the chloride increase, actually this directly related to the chloride source, what we deposit to or dump to the uh, watershed to the cause this problem. So. Follow up to yes, that. please. So you mentioned about the central uh, uh, salt uh, softening, the central softening. How many communities in the Twin City area are doing central softening currently? I know White Bear Lake is. Okay. I've I, toured I, that that uh, plant before. There must be many others, though. I suspect. I so far I have no idea yet. I think to me, central softening system is very good, but cost could be higher. And, uh, and also, and uh, based on our study, our stream actually is most contribute from uh, the ice and winter use, not from the water softening. Water softening actually kind of part of uh, contributing to our river. You can go through system to our river. So, so far we are talking mm. about here is so like uh, the icing in the winter, like a uh, impervious use of chloride for safety reasons. Thank you. Could you expand upon, and you touched on this, the negative ramifications to our flora and fauna on chloride? Like, what exactly happens to fish, for example, or the invertebrates that the fish eat? You know, like, how does it impact them or the plants? Like, what does too much chloride, and I know some chloride is necessary, but you get too much and bad things happen, but I'm not sure exactly I could art if I could articulate what exactly are those bad things. Sure, yeah, thanks uh, for that question, Mr. Chair and Committee. That's a good question. Um, it's uh, a good broad variety, so I'll just try to give maybe a couple of quick examples. So, um, mm -hmm. for example, amphibian eggs, like too much chloride, kind of, this isn't a perfect way of describing it, but kind of dries them up. You know, the, the mm. chloride... Uh, at the levels that we're talking about, levels of impairment, is actually toxic. So it's just uh, uh, some of these organisms are basically experiencing that they're swimming in toxic water. If you would imagine, um, you know, kind of picture an estuary where some fresh water and salt water is mixing naturally, there are some organisms that can tolerate those kind of conditions, and then there's the freshwater organisms that just can't. They can't survive. Their gills don't function. They're... Uh, um, eggs can't survive that chloride concentration. And then there's the, um, of course, on the ocean side, there's things that live in the salt water that if you get them into fresh water, then that's too dilute and the, that's, all, that's 
toxic for them. So, so answering uh, the question is a bit uh, organism by organism, or at least group by group of how it would affect them, but it's just, it, it creates a toxic environment is kind of the summary. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And so concentrations are doubling uh, or have doubled. If we get to 2040, and I understand in the last five years it's slowed down a, a little bit, but if we get to 2040 or 2050 um, and they doubled again, we're going to see more of these impacts to, uh, as you just described. And that goes all the way up the food chain, I imagine. Um, and we're going to be seeing less amphibians, less invertebrates, which means we see less fish in general and the things that feed on fish are impacted. It's just one thing after another. Yeah, and uh, additionally, we're not, we didn't include lakes in this study, but a, a an impact that's unique to lakes is, of course, streams are always flowing, rivers are always flowing. The chloride that's in Battle Creek right now is going to be somewhere else tomorrow. It's, it's moving, which is not true for lakes. Lakes, they're kind of capturing and concentrating that chloride. So what eventually happens in lakes is um, the chloride is, is heavier, it sinks to the bottom, and then it can just uh, kind of permanently be there in the bottom of the lake, kind of this, this dense zone, essentially, of salty water at the bottom of the lake. So that's, um, the impacts are really severe. And uh, mm. like I said earlier, chloride is permanent. Once it's in the water, we don't have technology to remove it. And is it worse the, uh, the farther you go down the Mississippi River? And I know they're I not think, salting as yeah, much farther right. down mm -hmm. south, yeah. but uh, you know, once you hit St. Louis or something like that, is it? I don't know. Maybe they don't test as much as we do. Yeah. I think so far, and the river concentration is still low, mm -hmm. especially in the St. Croix River. And uh, we have a actually we don't have a chloride criteria yet for the water standing for the stream in the river, but we have a drinking water 230 kilometer uh, milligram per liter. So um, most of when you flow through flush into the stream and go to the river, actually this bring to the Gulf of Mexico. But of course, mm -hmm. like you say, downstream will have a big problem, but still so far concentration is still not high enough no impact yet. This is why we need to pay attention now. And a big problem for us, of course, when you increase chloride uh, concentration more stream from the, from the river, will impact the biological system. But the immediate impact for us is drinking water. And like a, a, in the drinking water, when the chloride into the groundwater, stay there, concentration will higher. And this is going to be impact our drinking water somewhere, like I just mentioned, we taste salt. And also a few already have a chloride uh, impact. This is going to be, I think, an immediate big problem for us. But mm -hmm. we don't have information yet for groundwater uh, chloride pollutions. We start to pay attention now. <laughs> yeah. You just mentioned Battle Creek, and I go to the regional, regional park there from time to time, and uh, there's um, Highway 61, and then there's a bike walking path that's just a little bit lower than 61, and then there's a steep incline that goes right into the creek. And so highway, all of that junk that comes from 61, I mean, it, it must just go right in there, and that there's a monitoring station of the WAMP. Yep. Uh, I Wonder love that. The best <laughs> acronym of all time. It is. I want to call it the WAMPer. <laughs> you can. The WAMP. I love that. Um, which is right there, mm -hmm. too. You, you probably go there yep. regularly. Um, so, yeah, I imagine you know exactly where I'm talking about. It's, it's just a, yep. whenever the snow melts, I mean, it just yep. brings whatever was on the roadway. Exactly or whenever there's a heavy rain or not so heavy rain, right into the creek. 
And there's some beavers that uh, have made. Sure. Do you know? Do you know what I'm talking oh, about the beavers, there? Yeah, you know the, where the beavers are? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The beavers have been a problem for us for a couple years now. Oh, uh, I know, but I think they're really cool. <laughs> oh, they're super cute. <laughs> <laughs> they're very cute. <laughs> we'll agree to disagree on no, that. No, apparently it was an adorable <laughs> entire family, mom, dad, and two babies last year. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Just a comment. It sounds like whoever invents a cost-effective way to remove chloride is going to be really rich. So, exactly. <laughs> Get on it. <laughs> <laughs> or invents a different thing instead of chloride to put it down on our streets. I think I think good things now people start to pay attention now, and also like any new development, new highway. They require have a retention pond, so water, stormwater cannot directly flow to the stream, lake. No way, you need a retention pond. Now, problem is retention pond actually take salt into the groundwater, so this also mm. causes another problem too. So. Interesting. Any other questions? Fantastic presentation. Very interesting and. Uh, and this is another case of all hands on deck need to be on, on this really key issue. Appreciate it. Thanks for the work that you do. Thanks for Thank having you. us. And that takes us to the general manager's report. Mr. Chair and council members, I just want to mention that we have um, a situation that we think we have in good control, but there are... Um, there are a lot of folks that are concerned about the safety of the sewers in the University of Minnesota campus because students are coming back to school, they're gonna have football games. And we had our first incident on June 30th and last week, I think it was, they ran the, some video footage that showed sewer caps blowing up in the air mm -hmm. and that's gotten a whole lot of renewed interest. So there is, a, U has a, has a safety committee Parent, parent Safety Committee, we may attend that, but we're working with the governor's office to make sure that the um, situation is communicated well, that we've got surveillance set up for quick detection, we've got response set up with Minneapolis and St. Paul, so there's a, a good response team. And we know it's working, because the uh, second incident was August 2nd, and then on August 5th, we detected early upstream from the U, uh, a release, and we caught the source, and we're working with that company, so mm -hmm. we know that we've eliminated that source. Um, we can't track the first two, of course, because it was after the fact, but we know that they were above the university property, so there were concerns about whether it was something originating from the U. Um, so we will be meeting with the governor's office staff on Thursday and possibly following up with the U to make sure they understand we've got the situation in, in a good place. And it is a scary thing, though, to see those sewer caps go flying up and, mm -hmm. and have those situations develop. Does the source, the one that we just caught, does that match what we saw the first two? So it's a, you know, we know we have petroleum-based um, sources, but they were all a little bit unique. So we can't say, oh, this is just like the previous. Mm -hmm. We also, the first one, we didn't have the same level of opportunity to get samples. So we can't say that we've got a really good sample um, rep reflective of the first one. But we do think we've got some pretty effective response set up with a lot of our ES staff, as well as I mentioned, Minneapolis and St. Paul. So if we measure it, we'll be able to get samples, we'll be able to do a much better job of tracing it, but we'll also make sure it gets flushed so that we don't end up with a dangerous situation. And we are leading the investigation along with the partners you mentioned, the city of Minneapolis, and PCA. Yep. With MPCA, is, uh, so ES and MPCA are considered the lead on the investigation part. Staff are going the extra mile, another example of paying close attention to extra needs and still getting regular stuff done too. 
Scary situation, no doubt about it. All right, well, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the team. We're glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. And um, we do good work, as you can see. So with that, we are adjourned. I don't think yeah. This is Neka Ona. She's our new executive assistant. And she's getting trained in from Tessa. And so thanks to Tessa for standing in in the interim. Yes, agreed. Um, and this is week two for Neka. So <laughs> she's slowly coming up to speed with lots of stuff. But you'll, you'll find her replacing Tessa here in the near future. Could you, would you like to say a few comments to everyone, like your background or what's, what inspires you about environment? You're new services? to the Met Council, correct? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes, I am. So second week, um, I come from a background of working in education, um, and I am very passionate about water as well. I was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so land of 10,000 lakes. Um, my family comes from Nigeria, so... Um, just kind of having that background in how important water is there and the impact it has on people, you know, here and there. So, very We're not excited. making any more of it, are we? <laughs> you know, we got what we got, and so yeah. we better take darn good care of it. So very excited to be a part of this phenomenal team and, you know, join in all the cool and, you know, amazing projects that you guys are working on. Have you gone on a tour yet? I haven't, but I've been invited to one, so I'm looking Fantastic. forward to that. Yes. Very cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you.